Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Uh, a little bit later in the show, we will hear about the three affiliated tribes in Newtown. But first, joining me now is Bob Weefald, former state attorney general and judge and author of Moments. And we'll discuss that in a little bit, but Bob, thanks so much for joining us. Well, today. thank you very much for allowing me to be here with you. It's just a great day. As we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background, where you're originally from. Well, I grew up in Minot. I was born in Minnesota, but uh, my family moved to Minot in 1949. So I, when I was seven years old, I don't, I have the curse of not being a native North Dakotan, but I've, I've tried to live here as long as I could. And I, I grew up in Minot, graduated high school in 1960. I went to the University of North Dakota, absolutely loved it. Um, at the end of my time at UND in 1964, I had no skills, nothing to do, and as a social science major, so I joined the Navy. It turned out to be one of the best moves I've ever made in my life. I had a wonderful time in the Navy. And after my three years of active duty, I went to law school at the University of Michigan. And the amazing thing about that is I met Susan Weefald, uh, Susan Benchap, my wife, of all those years. And it's just been great. Uh, I had a chance to move back to Bismarck in 1970, where I was a law clerk for the Supreme Court. I uh, enjoyed that experience. It was a nine years in private practice, helped build a law firm, Wheeler, Wolf, Weefold, and Peterson. 1980, I was elected as Attorney General. I had a great time as Attorney General. 1984, I was unelected as Attorney General. Went back into private practice in 1985. Uh, tried to run for the Supreme Court in 1992. Came close, but not close enough. And I found out that was really a blessing because when I was elected District Court Judge in 1998, the job, best job I've ever had. I did have an occasion once in a while to sit up with the Supreme Court and I found it's much better to be able to make your own decision as opposed to having to get two or three other people to agree with you on a decision. Hmm. Well, Bob, uh, you, of course, uh, former state attorney general and judge, too. And so you've had an interesting uh, public uh, life, I guess, out there. But what made you decide to write your autobiography? Well, I, I just want to leave something for my kids and my grandkids. As it turns out, my, my kids, when I wrote this book, were fairly underwhelmed by it. But a lot of my family and friends really enjoyed it. And for me, writing it was just a, a, a breath of fresh air because I was able to recall all these things from my life. and talk about the positives and negatives, and I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, Justice Dan Crothers of our Supreme Court bought a copy of my book, read it, and we talked about it, and he said, he quoted someone famous who I can't name, but he said, everybody's got one book in them. It's the story of their life, and they should write it. And I did it, and I really am happy I did. Hmm. Interesting then, we'll probably come back to that, but talk about, you, you mentioned born in Minnesota, but I guess spent most of your time in North Dakota, but how did that, impact your life? Because obviously you went away to college in Michigan. We'll talk more about that too. Sure. How did growing up in North Dakota impact your life? Well, it was like winning the lottery. It's just a great place to live. It's a great place to grow up. Growing up in Minot in the 50s, uh, it, the, the key word there is freedom. You know, once you, got, once you got a bicycle, you could go anywhere. And as a kid, uh, you know, unlike today, uh, my mom never said, where are you going, Bob? Here's a cell phone, keep in touch. I'd, I'd go out of the house in the morning, I'd come back for supper, go out again at night, play kick with my buddies out in the street, play sandlot volleyball, uh, uh, baseball. It just was a great time, a magical time to grow up. I had a wonderful time uh, in high school, uh, junior high, and I went to five different grade schools. So by the time I got to junior high, I knew lots of people. It was just a great experience. Hmm. And then, of course, uh, you went on to the Navy. And uh, we, before we came on air, we talked a little bit about it. But for, for our viewers out there, let's talk some about your Navy career because it, it was a pretty long career? Well, it was, it was great. I, I wound up in the Navy by accident. I tried to join the Army and I flunked the draft physical, so I, I, had to, I had to force my way into the Navy and it turned out to be a real blessing. I, I, I never ever thought of joining the Navy until I flunked the Army draft physical, but this was before Vietnam started and they probably were trying not to take as many people. Uh, when I got in uh, to OCS, Navy OCS in Newport, I got my commission. Everything that I asked for went my way. I got to go to Navy Justice School, even though I wasn't a lawyer at the time. And I became the legal officer on my ship, USS Lion McCormick, a brand new hard charging guided mills, missile destroyer based out of San Diego. I had an absolutely wonderful time. I, I was the only reserve line officer on board the ship. Everybody else was gonna be chief of naval operations and me, I was gonna go home in three years. And as a result of that, the expectations weren't high and I could do anything I wanted on that ship. Uh, and it turned out I did a lot of it pretty well because uh, we were going we to go to Vietnam, uh, off the coast of Vietnam in 1966. And before we left, uh, my captain called me up and uh, asked me if, uh, if I wanted a new job. I said, well, what job do you have, Captain? He said, well, pick one. I said, you tell me what you want me to do. He said, I want you to be the gunnery officer. 
Now, I should have been thrilled to death and said, oh, that's great, Captain. But what I did say is, well, there's two problems to that. One, I don't know anything about gunnery. And second, you know, the weapons officer doesn't like me. Well, Bob, he said, you'll learn gunnery and I'll take care of the weapons officer. And it worked out great. I had, I learned all kinds of leadership skills in the Navy. And one of the best leadership skills I learned in the Navy was to let people do their jobs. Uh, I was in, as the gunnery officer was in charge of what's called G Division. I had gunner's mates and fire control technicians for the guns. And I can still remember the first day I went up to quarters on the 01 level, the chief, uh, Nance, my chief gunner's mate, called him to, all to attention, gave him a snappy salute. I returned it and I said, at ease. I said, Chief Nance, would you come up here? Kiner, my FD, would you come up here? So I said in the voice so everybody could hear, I said, I got a problem here. I said, I know absolutely nothing about gunnery, so let's make a deal. Chief Nance, you take care of the guns. Kind of, you take care of the FT gear. I'll take care of the weapons officer and do all the paperwork. Deal? Deal, they said. Never had a problem. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good deal. You, you were smart to, to do that. It, uh, now, let's talk some about law school in Michigan and the years you spent there. And obviously, you said earlier, that's where you met Susan. Yeah, I did. Uh, I went to the University of Michigan Law School. I was lucky enough to get in. Uh, my captain wrote me an endorsement. And, uh, I uh, applied early and while I was still in the Navy, and I wrote him a letter to Michigan and said, I can't go to law school for a couple of years left, but if you, you know, and they wrote me a letter and said, we'll take you, no problem, we'll hold a space for you, when you whenever you want to show up in law school. So I got there in the fall of 1967 with a class of about 350 people, and that fall is when they wiped out the graduate school deferments, so about 100 plus people in my class by the next fall were gone. Uh, one of them got killed in Vietnam. Uh, all of them came back to law school eventually. Uh, but it was a great experience for me. And being a veteran was, uh, I had no pressure on it because I didn't have to worry about the draft or anything like that. And I joined the Navy Reserve and went to my meetings. Well, the one thing about the University of Michigan Law School that really made, made life great for me is in, on one of the first days, we had a big assembly and one of the deans came up and said to us, if you are smart enough to get into the University of Michigan Law School, you will graduate. I said, thank you, Jesus. And so I, I didn't have any, I didn't have any problems after that. I, I, uh, I knew I wasn't gonna be editor-in-chief of the Law Review. Uh, there are a lot of really smart kids there. And I knew from day one that I was coming back to North Dakota to practice law and I wanted to get in politics and that was my goal and everything worked out great and I did come back to North Dakota. It was uh, a, a great experience. Well, now, you mentioned, uh, let's back up to the Navy just a minute, you spent how many active and then how many as a reserve? I spent three years in active duty and then I joined the Navy Reserve and I spent 24 years in the Navy Reserve. I, I drilled uh, uh, one, night a, one night a week for my first year and a half of law school at the Broadhead Naval Army in Detroit. And then this last year and a half, I drilled weekends, one weekend a month on a little ship, a little patrol craft uh, based in Detroit. And, we take it out in Lake Erie on the weekends and drive around and pull into a Canadian port and have a party at night. And it was a wonderful experience. And I came back to North Dakota and we moved to Bismarck. I joined the Navy Reserve in Fargo and went to the Navy Reserve Center in Fargo for the better part of uh, those 24 years uh, and had a great time. I was able to command a couple of Navy Reserve units. I had a lot of great active duty. I, I've been to all the coast. I've been, got to Portugal, Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, Hawaii, I had just a wonderful career, and I was, uh, I was properly surprised every time I got advanced, and I was able to retire as a captain uh, on October 1st, 1991. And the day I retired, I was in San Diego for the decommissioning of my ship. So my ship and I retired on the same day, and it was a lot of fun. Mm. Now, go back to Michigan, and uh, that's where you met Susan. I did. We met in the Lutheran Student Center. Uh, it was, uh, we were both standing for office for to be on the student vestry, and as I walked back, this woman tugged on my sleeve and said, who are you, and how did you get here because I've never seen you in church? I said, good idea, because I've been in church every Sunday and I've never seen you. Well, so we went to our uh, organizational meeting. I'm the oldest one there, of course, because I'm a veteran, and they got to elect the president of the vestry. I said, don't look at me. I said, I'm a sailor, I've been to all those places. Oh, they said, you'd be perfect, we love a sinner. <laughs> so I got to be uh, president of Vestry, and my first big job in that was Easter breakfast in 1968. Beautiful day, I can remember it clearly, and I prepared the breakfast, had a couple of people help me, I did all the cleanup, and uh, so I'm just about all cleaned up. And this uh, girl with a nice yellow wool suit walks down the kitchen, she said, will you walk around the block with me? And I said, I will if you take out the garbage. 
and I've been taking it out ever since. <laughs> uh, all right, let's come back. Uh, how did you get involved into the politics, uh, you know, uh, when you came back to, to Bismarck? Well, the truth of the matter is I always wanted to be in politics. Uh, I, I remember in 1952 when Eisenhower's first campaign, I delivered Republican uh, literature for Eisenhower door-to-door -door in Shirley Court in Minot. When I was in uh, growing up in Minot High and Minot Junior High, I was active in different leadership organizations. 1959, it was just like the perfect storm. I was elected president of student council. I was elected governor of Boise State. I went to Boise Nation. I really got the bug. Uh, so when I, uh, I didn't have a particularly successful career in law school, I mean, in undergraduate in terms of uh, being in student government, but I really had the urge to be involved in politics. And uh, Boise State was a real motivator for me to get involved in politics. Um, and so I, I, I made a decision to come back to North Dakota, my home. I, I actually never ever thought of any living any place else other than North Dakota. And I wanted to get involved in politics and I, I came back to North Dakota. I started uh, a, a law firm after my, uh, with uh, two other experienced lawyers and another lawyer. So we had a law firm we built and we were quite successful at it. And I, I, I started working from day one in Republican politics. And as it turns out, I realize now later writing my book and looking back at life, I was a lot better at party politics than I was at real world politics. You know, at party politics, both sides, they, they see issues in black and white. Uh, when you're in real world politics, it's a lot more nuanced and you gotta be, you know, could be, could be A, could be C, could be D, we'll decide tomorrow. Uh, I found that I was really good in party politics and I wound up, uh, my first office I ran for was attorney general. I'd never done anything else besides that. And I worked very, very hard. I was the first person to announce in July of 1979. I started contacting people. I would contact people I never knew and ask them to support me. I was active as a I was district chairman and so I had a lot of contacts and uh, the uh, endorsement campaign and uh, there were four of us running for attorney general and. I happened to come out on top and it was really exciting. It was a great moment. And then I just pitched myself full blown into the campaign and ran straight ahead. Uh, I remember the guy who was doing my advertising for me, Don Nelson in Fargo, uh, wrote me a, a note a few days before the election and said, you know, you know, there's other things in life, because everybody expected I would lose. <coughs> and I, uh, I won by about, uh, 10,000 votes, and the problem was Al Olson was the attorney general, he was running for governor, and Alice Olson was the Democrat nominee for attorney general, and she was, you know, everybody thought, well, that's gonna be a lead pipe cinch for her. So I won, and it was uh, a, a great, great feeling. I I loved being attorney general. I had a great time in that job. I, and during those years, you had some pretty high profile uh, oh. <laughs> cases to deal with. I had my plate full. I, I you know, I'll, I, I think, there's no other attorney general in the state of North Dakota history now or in the past that had as many difficult issues to deal with as I did. The very first issue facing me was a lawsuit brought by the Association of Retarded Citizens. And what had happened is uh, the state of North Dakota had woefully, painfully neglected uh, its state hospital in Grafton where retarded people were warehouses, what they were. Uh, when we got sued, we tried to find an expert witness. The best expert witness we could find for the state of North Dakota said, it's absolutely horrible. So I made a decision as attorney general that we would admit liability. We, we would admit we were wrong in the lawsuit, which is an interesting way to handle a lawsuit. I said, we lose, we admit that. So the lawsuit really became nothing more than talking about what the remedy should be. But we had a big trial anyway. And early on in the lawsuit, I, I proposed a settlement. And I met with legislative leaders and the governor and. Well, they said, yeah, go ahead and try it. So I tried it and uh, I got a response from Judge Van Sickle who said, hey, this is really pretty good. I think this is pretty fair. If you know, if you add another 15, 20 nurses to this thing, I think uh, we, you know, we might be able to try this for a while. So I went back and told the legislative leaders and the governor, look, we got this deal done. If we just need a couple, you know, 18, 20 nurses. And they said, absolutely not. One legislative leader said, no federal judge is gonna tell me what to do. And I said, well, I can tell you this. When, when the judgment comes in, the federal judge will tell you exactly what to do. I said, the first thing they're gonna do to pay this bill is they're gonna auction your desk off and then they're gonna start from there. We had a, we had a total losing hand. We, we, we could not win. And I thought as attorney general, representing all the citizens, 
I couldn't say that it, you know, the people in Grafton didn't count as citizens. We had an obligation to defend them as much as we had to defend anybody. And so the, the only legally just proper thing to do was to say to those people, you're right. You are absolutely right. Grafton is horrible and we've got to fix it. Hmm. Well, Bob, it wasn't a very popular decision. Yeah, we're, we're gonna turn away, I guess, from, from at least this political sure. side, if you don't mind, because I know there's a subject you wanna talk about and we're gonna run out of time if we don't. Sure. So I'm, I'm gonna hold this up and talk about the new ship that you've been working on, oh, the wow. USS North Dakota. Can you tell us about that? And oh. of course, uh, some people are gonna say, why a submarine? Oh. Well, listen, why a ship is the question. We're landlocked, we're the fire. We are the one state that's farthest from a year-round saltwater port. Uh, there was a first ship named at USS North Dakota. It was a battleship, BB-29. It was commissioned in 1910 and uh, decommissioned in 1923. It was the first ship in the Navy that was steam turbine engines. And you ask what that is. If you look at the movie uh, uh, Titanic, which is coming back now, you see the engine room with the big pistons going up and down. Well, a turbine is something that spins. You, North Dakota is the first one. That's the technology everybody used in ships after that. Uh, it was a great ship, uh, but I thought we needed a second ship named for the state. So after I finished the office of Attorney General in 1985, I joined the Military Affairs Committee of the Bismarck Man and Chamber of Commerce. I went to a couple of meetings and uh, I finally said, we need to have a project. So I proposed at one meeting, I said, we need to take on a couple of projects. They said, what's that? I said, you know, we need to build a state veteran cemetery south of Fort Lincoln in Mandan, and we need to get a second ship named after the state of North Dakota. Yeah, they said, it's a great idea. And my friend, Major General Murray Sagsdean, who's in charge of floods in North Dakota, said, I'll take care of the, uh, I'll take care of the cemetery. And I said, great. And I said, I'll take care of the ship. Well, Murray, with his contacts in the National Guard, got that cemetery done. It's absolutely beautiful. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. That's where I'm gonna, I'm gonna rest uh, when, when time comes. But I said, I'll take care of the ship. For 23 years, I wrote letters to the uh, president, the secretary of Navy, our congressional delegation once or twice a year. I said, come on, let's get this done. No one would help out. So finally, in January of 2008 or 2007, I, I wrote my annual Dear Kent, Byron, and Earl letter. I said, come on, you guys are all in powerful positions in the Congress, let's get this done. In my last paragraph of my letter, I said, I do not want to have to retire early from my job as a, as a, as a judge to run for Congress, so please get this taken care of. Well, Byron Jorgen, tongue-in-cheek, wrote me a letter back and said, don't worry, Bob, I can get you sent to sea for six years, whatever you want, but I'll take care. You don't have to run. He said, I will take care of this. And sure enough, he got it done. So we now have a second ship named for the state of North Dakota. This is an extremely, extremely big deal for our state. I know I heard a guy mention that submarine, they're never going to be able to see us. It's going to be underwater. Well, that's true, but it's, it's going to carry the name North Dakota all over the world, and it's going to carry the name North Dakota and the U.S. Navy for all 33 years of its life expectancy. It's going to be a great, great thing for the state of North Dakota. Well, you say 33 years of life expectancy, but when is it uh, set to be commissioned? Though? It's going to be commissioned in early 2014. It's being built right now. I suppose in terms of metal and things being welded together, it's probably 70% complete right now, but there's a lot of uh, parts that have to go. So this, uh, this spring, 2012, our, our sponsor, Katie Fowler, she's the wife of Vice Admiral Jeff Fowler, he's a Bismarck High School graduate, and I was his blue and gold officer when he went to the Naval Academy. Uh, she's gonna go out to Groton, Connecticut where the ship's being built, and she's gonna sign her name on the hull of the ship. That's to authenticate it, and then a welder's gonna weld her signature into the hull. And so she'll be permanently a part of the ship. The next event that's gonna happen is the ship is gonna be christened, and that should be in 2013. Uh, and they're going to turn it over. It'll, the contractors will take it out to sea and drive it around to see if there's any leaks in it. And that'll take a while. And then they'll finally turn the ship over to the Navy and say, we don't think it leaks, we think it works. And the Navy's going to say, oh, we'll see about that. And they're going to take and drive it around for a while. And the crew's been assembled right now. And then in uh, 2014, it's going to be commissioned. Uh, we don't know where that's going to happen or the exact day, but it's going to be a big event. And we are going to have North Dakotans, all of our state, North Dakotans are going to be out there for the commission, and they're going to be out there for the christening. These are big events and they're going to be wonderful, wonderful parties for us. Well, we look forward to that opportunity. Uh, Bob, we've only got about a minute left. So, uh, you know, you, you've led an interesting life. I and, have. And done, done a lot. But so what, what, what can you say has, has really impacted you the most in your life? Well, uh, being married to Susan Weefold this the, the joy of my life, the love of my life. It's uh, the best thing that ever happened to me. But I can tell you this, being a judge was absolutely the best job I've ever had. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I love being attorney general. I felt like I've won the lottery, been able to live in North Dakota and raise my family here. We're living in a retirement house right now, the same house we lived in for 40 years, and we're gonna be there till the good Lord calls us home. Hmm. 
Well, Bob, if people want more information about your book or maybe about uh, the new USS North Dakota, where can they go? Well, for the new USS North Dakota, they'll go to the Bismarck Mandan Chamber website, and they got a link on there at the North Dakota, all mm -hmm. the information you'll need on that. For the book, the State Bar Foundation of Bismarck is selling those for $10 a piece. Bob, thanks so much for joining Thank us you, today. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Stay tuned for more. The three affiliated tribes are located on the Fort Berthold Reservation, consisting of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara tribes. The reservation spans about one million acres in west central North Dakota near Newtown. Here's a look at the history of the tribes and a tour of the headquarters. My name is Marilyn Hudson, and I'm the administrator here at the Three Affiliated Tribes Museum in Newtown, North Dakota. The idea for the museum came about shortly after the Garrison Dam. You could almost have called it a refugee town at the time that Newtown was began. There were people from the flooded village of Sanish. There were people from the flooded village of Van Hook. There were at least seven communities. With this unlikely beginning of people thrown together arose the idea of a museum. It just so happened that a lady by the name of Helen Goff, a member of our tribe, a lady of Arikara descent, she looks around her and she sees, you know, a lot of things being lost, a lot of tradition being lost, a lot of memories being lost, uh, a lot of physical facilities actually being lost under the waters of the Garrison Reservoir. There's a spirit of vision and she thinks, you know, maybe something should be done to preserve what's left of our culture, what's left of our heritage. In addition to leaving the funds from her estate, she donated a lot of her personal belongings. We have a case in the museum here that has uh, some of her clothing items, some of the beadwork uh, and so forth. The museum opened its doors in 1964. Helen Goff did not live to see the museum completed. She passed away before the museum was fully constructed. With the items that we have, we try to tell a story. We try to tie in, you know, the historical significance of that exhibit. Almost without exception, everything in this museum has been donated. The museum has never had the budget to purchase any items. So almost everything here is from the people of Fort Berthold and other people. Other people that maybe as children lived here, maybe their family acquired a pipe bag or maybe a pair of moccasins. And in their older years, you know, they say, you know, this item really should go home. And they bring it back to, to the area. We try to label things, you know, that, so that people see there is a a story. This shirt did belong to somebody. This pipe bag belonged to this gentleman. This is who made it. He gave it to so-and-so at a certain event. Why did he give it to this person? Because that's a custom. It's a gift. So you try to take an exhibit and make it lively. You try to put some life in it. A lot of times the people that live here, this is their heritage. It's an everyday thing for them, but it's the visitors coming from Massachusetts or New York City or Las Gatas, California, like we had yesterday, and they're interested in the history of the Indian people. I had a call from a lady from Chicago planning a trip to this area, and she was like, what will I see there if I come there? I said, well, we have the Four Bears Lodge and Casino. We have the Missouri River. We have some reconstructed earth lodges. You would probably see Reunion Point. That's where the captains were reunited. It's just right outside our door. We don't have a lot of built up attractions, but we have the native land, we have the trees, we have the hills. We have things that would be pretty much the same hills, the same prairie, the same trees, the same birds that Lewis and Clark observed. And I mentioned the young people uh, that today that have a, a totally different way of life. 
they're, they're more technology oriented. And I think museums have to change to meet the demographics of, of our society. There will come a time when they will be ready to learn more about their ancestors. What was it like to live on the plains here 200 years ago? What was it like when Lewis and Clark came through? What did my great, great, great grandparents, how did they live? And there will come a time when there will be an interest, but I think it, that eventually every young person will reach that point when they will want to know. And they will be glad then that there is a facility like the museum where they can go and learn about it. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding provided by a grant from Native American Public Telecommunications and by the members of Prairie Public.